So hello everyone, good morning and welcome to the first CMSA colloquium of this semester. Today we are very glad to have Tian Yang as our speaker. Tian obtained his PhD in 2013 from Rutgers University. And after four years at Stanford, he joined the Texas NM University in 2017, where he remains today. So without further ado, let me give the stage to Tian, who will tell us, um, 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 who will give us a talk on this very interesting topic of hyperbolic geometry and quantum invariance. So please. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. So um, in the title, hyperbolic geometry and uh, quantum invariance are two um, different approaches of um, doing three manifolds. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. And uh, hyperbolic geometry follows the work of Thurston, Perlman, and many others. And the quantum invariance follows the work of Jung's, Witten, Rashtik, and Triev, Kashaev, and uh, many others. So um, I think I'll explain these two approaches using um, examples. So here, Suppose we have a uh, knot in R3, in our three-dimensional space, and a knot is the embedding of a circle in, in our space. And uh, uh, can you see the arrow? Yes, we can see it. OK, good. And uh, um, sometimes we can also include uh, a point at infinity to have a compact three manifold S3. So we can consider this uh, not this embedded circle to be in the three sphere. Okay. And the hyperbolic geometry gives us a complete remaining metric with constant sectional curvature negative one. So that's a, that's a metric, uh, that's a space that is negatively curved. So you can imagine that um, around you, no matter where you are, every plane is like a saddle surface. It's negatively curved. That's a, um, that's a hyperbolic metric. And uh, it is pretty hard to believe that, at least at the beginning, that uh, we can always find such, uh, such a, a hyperbolic metric. But Thurston's geometrization conjecture later proved by Perlman, tells us that every um, three manifold could be canonically cut into small pieces. And each piece has um, some kind of standard um, remaining metric, and most of them are hyperbolic. Okay, most of the pieces are hyperbolic. So hyperbolic metrics are pretty common. Okay. And once you have a metric like this, a hyperbolic metric, then you can consider invariance such as the volume, which measures the size of the manifold in this metric and the Chern Simons invariant of this metric and the Redmaster torsion and its twisted version coming from this metric. So let me maybe mention one thing. Uh, Red master torsion, the original one, is a topological invariant, uh, which is already pretty strong. So the original red master torsion can distinguish um, manifolds which are not homeomorphic to each other, but homotopic to each other. Okay, so it's already pretty strong. And the twisted version uh, is even stronger. Okay. And of course, you can also consider other invariants, such as the length of the shortest geodesic in this metric, or the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian operator. Okay. But today, I'll focus on these three invariants, the volume, the transcendence invariant, and the twisted Randmaster torsion. Okay. And hyperbolic metric um, satisfies a very special property that once it exists, it is unique. That is the most of rigidity theorem. Okay? Um, if it exists, it's the only one. And as a consequence, 
all these geometric invariants are all topological invariants because the metric is, is unique. Okay, so all these um, geometric invariants, the volume, the transcendence invariant, the red master torsion are topological invariants. Okay, so those are the um, invariants from the hyperbolic geometry side. Now for the quantum side, we have the, the invariants constructed from the representation theory of, of so-called quantum groups. And if you're not familiar with quantum groups, you can just consider them as some kind of deformation of the classical Lie algebra. Okay. And uh, for example, uh, from the simplest one, the two-dimensional special linear group, SL2, uh, from the representation of the quantum version of that, we have the so-called the color Jones polynomials which um, for each not K, such a not K, uh, gives a sequence of Laurent polynomials in some variable T with um, integer coefficient, one for each integer. And actually those um, index corresponds to the dimension of the representation of the quantum SL2. Remember, um, irreducible representations of the Lie algebra SL2 are indexed by the dimension. And that's the same for the quantum version. And for each um, n-dimensional representation, for each uh, irreducible representation of the quantum SL2, we can construct a Laurent polynomial um, of the not K. For example, this figure eight knot uh, has the nth color Jones polynomial in this form. Okay. So it, my point here is that uh, they are computable, very, um, they're very concrete Laurent polynomials. And when the dimension equals two, namely when we consider the fundamental representation of the quantum SL2, uh, we recover the famous Jones polynomial originally constructed from the representation of some operator algebras, okay? And here, as you can see, these two are very different approaches. One is geometric and the other is purely algebraic or combinatorial. However, these two approaches are surprisingly and closely related. Um, one famous example is the following volume conjecture, okay? So originally uh, proposed by Kashaev and then uh, reformulated by Jun Murakami and Hitoshi Murakami in the current form. So suppose here we have a hyperbolic knot. That means we can put a complete remaining metric with constant sectional curvature negative one. In other words, a hyperbolic a structure on the complement of the knot. Then we have the following relationship. Okay. So let me explain this relationship. Here on the left hand side, um, we have the colored Jung's polynomials. And recall, um, colored Jung's polynomials have a variable t. And here we evaluate for the nth colored Jones polynomial, we evaluate at the first nth primitive root of unity, e to the two pi over n. And if you do this, here we'll have a sequence of complex numbers. And then we take the norm of these complex numbers to have a sequence of real numbers. And then here we take log and divided by n and let n go to infinity. So on the left hand side, we are essentially computing the exponential growth rate of this sequence of numbers. And on the right hand side, we have the hyperbolic volume of the complement of this knot. Okay. Um, in another word, 
the norm of the values of the colored Jones polynomials evaluated at suitable root of unity growth exponentially in the index n, and the growth rate is the hyperbolic volume of not complement. Okay? So this is the volume conjecture. I think it's one of the central problems in low dimensional topology. Maybe only second to the four dimensional smooth Poincare conjecture. Okay? So it's a very important one. And for this conjecture, there are um, lots of numerical evidence. And for families of examples, people can prove it rigorously. Okay? But uh, in general, it is still wide open. Okay? So here, uh, it tells us that colored Jones polynomials contain the information of the um, hyperbolic structure, at least the volume. And it is proof that uh, um, color Jones polynomials are stronger invariants than just the volume, because um, we have examples, we have nodes that have the same volume, but different color Jones polynomials. For example, here, these two nodes, um, on the left, we have the so-called 5-2 knot, and on the right, we have the negative 2-3-7 preso knot. So there are two different knots, but they have the same volume, and they have different colored Jung's polynomials. So colored Jung's polynomials contain more information than the volume. Now the question is, what's the extra information? And then um, we have this asymptotic expansion conjecture due to, um, due to Gukov, but uh, I think it's based on the original idea of Witten, which says that if we consider the full expansion, asymptotic expansion of the sequence of complex numbers in the index N, we'll get not only the volume, but also the transcendence invariant of the not complement and also the twisted uh, red master torsion. And here it is the red master torsion to be precise, twisted by the adjoint action of the holonomy representation of this hyperbolic structure. Um, so these um, geometric invariants are the part of the extra information. And also here, we have a capital O of one over N. And this is conjectured to be a power series of this one over N. And all the coefficients of this power series are supposed to be geometric or at least topological invariants of the manifold. But no one knows what those invariants are. We don't know whether they are new invariants or some already known topological invariants, but there are infinitely many invariants there, okay? Coming from the expansion of this um, colored Jones polynomials. Um, are there any questions? So how are these related to, to this uh, invariants of finite height or? Uh... Um, I no idea. Uh -huh. Okay. So this can be computed by some Feynman diagram, right? So for, for this higher order um, invariant, is that right? You think? So this can be computed by some uh, Feynman diagram, uh, uh, is that right? I'm not uh, sure actually. Uh-huh, okay. So by compute, do you mean? Um... So uh, this seems to be uh, coming out of the perturbative expansion of uh, transignment theory. And mm -hmm. these terms point, can yeah. be, right, like uh, it's a sum over a certain Feynman diagram. Then I think so, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is the story for a not complement. Now for a general three manifold, the picture is pretty similar. So um, for general three manifold, sometimes we can consider closed oriented three manifold 
sometimes we can consider like manifold with boundary or non-oriented free manifold. I mean, just more than not complement. Then on the hyperbolic geometry side, we can still put a hyperbolic metric on the manifold. And for such a metric, we can consider invariance as the volume, the transcendence invariance, and the, the twisted red master torsion. Again, by the most of rigidity theorem, all these invariants are topological invariants of the manifold. If the, if the um, hyperbolic structure exists, okay? Now, on the quantum side, uh, still we can consider the invariants constructed from the representation of quantum groups. And for the representation of the um, quantum SL2, here we have the Rashtikin triad invariants, which for each um, here, we should assume that the manifold is closed and oriented. Then for such a manifold, for each integer R, we have, we have a complex number. So Rashtikin triad invariants are a sequence of complex valued invariants of the manifold. And here, as you can see, we also, I also put a little Q here. And this little Q is a choice of the root of um, rth, rth root of unity for, for this R. Okay. So in the definition, there's a choice of the root of unity involved. And this Rashtik and Dwarf invariants mathematically realize Witten's invariant originally uh, constructed using ideas from physics, from quantum field theory, or uh, quantum transcendence theory, if I put it correctly. Okay, And it is um, at this particular root of unity, e to the pi i over r, that people consider this um, Rashtik and Trife invariance as a mathematical realization of Witten's invariant, because the, uh, the TQFT uh, behind those invariants at this particular root of unity is uh, so-called unitary. Um, that means the inner product on the vector space is positive definite at this particular root of unity. Okay? So people consider this as um, a theory coming from physics. Okay? okay, and in this case, the volume conjecture namely the relationship between the Rashtik and Traf invariants and the hyperbolic volume was um, formulated by Qing Tao Chen and myself in 2015, where um, here we consider a closed oriented uh, hyperbolic three manifold. And then we have the following relationship. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty similar to the Kashaev volume conjecture that um, the value, the Rashtik and Traf invariants, if we consider the, the norm, grows exponentially with growth rate, the hyperbolic volume. And here I want to mention that the key is really the, this choice of the root of unity Q. And here, we choose the value e to the two pi i over r. And for the invariant, here's a technical detail. So for the invariant to be defined at this root of unity, r has to be odd. So namely, we have to have a primitive root. And if you remember from the previous slice, this is exactly not the root of unity that um, the invariant realizes Witten's invariant. So in at the root e to the pi i over r, uh, we have Witten's invariant. But here it is exactly not that one. It's a different root. I think this um, somehow explains why it took people so long to uh, find this correct formulation. It's um, almost 20 years after Kashaev's original volume conjecture. 
because previously people were focusing on the different route, probably a wrong route too much. Okay? But it is really not the, the physical one that um, gives us this exponential growth. Okay, and uh, um, again, for this one, we have lots of numerical evidence and uh, for families of examples, um, people can prove it rigorously. Okay. And uh, the, asymptot the corresponding asymptotic expansion conjecture was formulated one year later. Independently, independently by Ozuki and uh, Gang Romo and uh, Yamazaki. Okay. And similarly to the previous case, in the exp asymptotic expansion of the Rashtikan drive invariant at um, the new root of unity, um, people see volume transcendence invariant and uh, the red master torsion. And also the invariants coming from the uh, the coefficients of this uh, power series in one over r. Okay, so you can see um, these are all examples of the relationship between these two different approaches, hyperbolic geometry and the quantum invariants. Um, I think, are there any questions? So I think in the rest of this talk, I will represent um, two works that um, takes advantage of this relationship between the two. Okay. Um, in the first one, so I'll propose a approach of um, solving the volume conjecture, solving these two conjectures. Okay. And uh, where we'll use um, ideas and techniques from hyperbolic geometry. And the second one, uh, we answer a purely geometric question, but the idea comes from the study of this um, quantum invariant. Okay. And uh, um, so in the first one, we propose to um, study the volume conjecture um, for the closed manifold uh, by studying the so-called relative rush t can drive invariance for pairs. <clears throat> okay, so here we consider a pair, M and L, where M is a three manifold, um, closed oriented, and L is a framed link in M. Okay? And for simplicity, if you don't know what frame links are, you can just consider um, links. And the links are embedding of a um, finite number of circles inside the manifold. So if you have only one circle, then you have a knot. But in general, we may have many circles, then we have a link, okay? And on the hyperbolic geometry side, as you can see, I'm telling the same story the third time. Uh, for a pair, we can consider the hyperbolic cone matrix for a pair like this. and uh, what is a hyperbolic cone matrix? It is a metric on the MB manifold M, where the restriction on the complement of the knot is a hyperbolic metric. Not necessarily complete. And here we allow cone singularities along the link. Okay. And uh, as a technical requirement, uh, we want the link in this metric to be a geodesic. Okay, so uh, on the complement we have hyperbolic metric, and along the link we have cone singularities, and we require that along each component of the link the cone angles are all the same. Okay, so for each component, we have a cone angle, a fixed cone angle, but different components may have different cone angles. Okay, and the cone 
matrix actually interplay the complete hyperbolic matrix on the complement and the complete matrix on the ambient manifold in the sense that when all the cone angles are equal to zero, then we have a complete hyperbolic matrix on the complement of the link. And when all the cone angles are equal to two pi, then we have a complete hyperbolic matrix on the ambient manifold map. Um, we can look at this picture. So here we have a cone singularity along the link. And when the cone angles, when the cone angle becomes zero, we have a cusp here. And that gives a complete hyperbolic metric on the complement. And when the cone angle becomes two pi, then this point becomes the smooth point. And then we have a complete hyperbolic metric on the whole manifold. So cone matrix may interplay the complete, uh, complete metric on the complement and the complete metric on the ambient manifold. Okay. Now, um, and for such a metric, we can also consider invariants such as volume, transcendence, and the uh, twisted red mass proportions. All these invariants are defined for cone metrics. Okay. And uh, on the quantum side, we have this relative uh, rush tegan drive invariants, where which uh, again for each r, integer r, it gives a complex number to every such triple, m, l, and n, where m, l is this, this pair, the manifold and uh, a frame link inside. And this uh, bold n is a coloring of the components of the link. So for each component of L, we put a integer and we want this integer to be in between zero and uh, R minus two as a technical condition. So for each triple, the ambient manifold L, um, the link L, uh, sorry, the ambient manifold M, the link L, and a coloring of the components of the link, we have a complex value of the invariant. And this relative version of the invariant uh, actually unify the colored Jones polynomials, at least values of colored Jones polynomials and the original rush tegan drive invariant for closed manifold. So when the ambient manifold is the three sphere, then this um, relative version of the invariant is actually values of the um, of the nth colored Jones polynomial. Okay, and when all the colorings are equal to zero, then we have the rush tegan drive invariant of the ambient manifold M. Okay. So now it's probably a good time to briefly tell you how the invariants are defined. Okay. Um, so the, many, the invariant is defined using um, surgery of a manifold, of manifold. So what is a surgery? Um, suppose here we have a link L prime in S3. Then we first remove a turbular neighborhood of this link. That's a union of uh, finitely many solid tori. So we, we remove finitely many solid tori. And then we glue them back in a probably different way. And if we do that, we'll have a different three manifold. So we remove some solid tori and we glue them back in a different way. And that is a surgery, okay? That is a manifold obtained uh, by doing surgery. And for each component, the ways of gluing a solid tori back is indexed by rational numbers. I'm just mentioning it here. So surgeries are indexed by, um, 
tuples of rational numbers, okay? And here, suppose this M is obtained by doing surgery along this frame link, this link L primed, and another link L is um, inside M. And since both L and L prime are one dimensional submanifold in a three dimensional manifold, we can, by doing perturbation, we can make sure that they don't um, intersect each other. Okay. So our trip, our pair M and L could be represented by this um, link diagram here, where by doing surgery along this green part, L prime, we have the MB manifold M and the link L is here. Okay. Now, once we have such a link, um, diagram, we can define the, the relative Rashtigan drive invariance as follows. Okay, so of course, um, this is very confusing if I don't explain <laughs> what it means. So, um, here in the bracket, we first have this, um, this diagram, and we cable this diagram by um, different linear combination of um, knot diagrams. And here for the component where you do the surgery, we cable it by this um, empty box. Okay? And the empty box represents the so-called Kirby coloring, which is a special linear combination of diagrams. Okay? And uh, for the components of the link L, we cable it by the um, so-called the jones winslow projectors. And here, this um, little n is exactly the one given by the color. Okay. So both the jones winslow projectors and the Kirby coloring are linear combinations of um, diagrams. And they capture the behavior of the representation of the um, of quantum SL2. Remember, the invariant comes from the representation of quantum groups, and uh, that's how the representation theory comes in. Uh, the behavior of those representations um, is captured by these um, various like, diagrams. Okay, so by doing this, we have a very complicated linear combination of diagrams in the plane in R2. And once we have such a diagram, we can take this bracket. And this is the Kaufman bracket, which gives um, each diagram in R2 a complex number. And it is given by the following two rules. And number one tells us, essentially tells us, um, for a diagram, how we can reduce the number of crossings by one. We do this, okay? And following this rule, if we keep reducing the number of crossings of this diagram, eventually we'll end up with linear combination of diagrams without any crossing. And there'll be a bunch of circles, okay? And then uh, rule number two tells us once we see a circle component, we change it into this factor, negative Q minus Q to the power negative one. Well, this Q is exactly the root of unity in the definition of the, of the invariant. And that is how the invariant depends on the choice of this root of unity Q. Okay. So by doing this, um, we assign this linear combination of diagrams a complex number. And here uh, we have uh, another constant independent, essentially independent of the topology of the triple. Okay. So that's the uh, relative rush and drive invariance. And from the definition, we can see that if the MB manifold is the three, it's just the three sphere, 
then we don't do any surgery along anything. That means we don't have um, this part. And if we remove this part from the diagram, we have exactly the definition of the color Jones polynomials. Namely, we cable the components of the link by Jones window projectors and then take the Kaufman bracket. And if all the colorings are zero, then we don't have this part. And that is exactly the definition of the rush taken drive invariant of the closed manifold and obtained by doing a surgery along this link. Okay. So that's why the relative uh, invariant unifies the, um, the color Jones polynomials and the, um, the rush taken drive invariants. Okay, now um, with my student Kaho Wang, we uh, formulate the relationship between the relative rush taken traffic invariants and the hyperbolic volume of the cone structures. In particular, we clarify the relationship between the colorings and the cone angles. Okay. So here, suppose we have this pair M and L. And for the L, we have this sequence of colorings indexed by R. And uh, first, we'll assume that for each K, each component of the link, this limit exists. And what is this? This is 4 pi times NKR divided by R and minus 2R. And we take the absolute value. Okay. So, um, since we require each nkr to be in between zero and r minus two, then this limit, I mean, this ratio is in between zero and four pi. So the difference in the absolute value is in between zero and two pi, which is a perfect interval for angles. Okay? And we assume that um, these limits exist and we collect them and we call it theta. And second, we assume that a metric, a hyperbolic cone metric on M with singular locus, the link L and cone angles, this theta exists. So we assume that such a metric, cone metric exists and we denote it by uh, M, L and theta. So this is M with this cone metric. Okay. Then we have this relationship. Okay. The growth rate of this relative rush taken traffic invariance with this sequence of colorings equals the volume of um, this hyperbolic cone metric. In particular, the cone angles theta are given by um, the colorings NR in this particular way. Okay, and uh, it took us one more year to establish the asymptotic expansion conjecture. And uh, here, besides the volume transcendence and the torsion, we have something new, which is the length of the geodesics L in the cone metric. Okay, okay. Um, I think that's enough for conjectures. Now let me um, talk about some uh, solid math theorem. So um, we conject, we, we prove the, these two conjectures for a family of, actually a universal family of examples. And this family is, uh, this family is um, first, um, so we prove it for the pair, for pairs M and L, such that the first, the complement of um, this link is a so-called fundamental shadow link complement. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what fundamental shadow link complements are later. And, uh, Recall that um, if this is true, 
then it is e equivalent to saying that uh, the ambient manifold M is obtained by doing surgery along this fundamental shadow link complement. And, uh, uh, and also recall that uh, surgeries are parametrized by rational numbers. But here we need the technical condition that um, M is actually obtained from the fundamental shadow link complement by integral surgeries. Okay, but uh, recently, uh, Kahal with my other student, uh, Tusha Pandey, actually are able to remove this second technical condition. Okay, and here, um, this is a this is a strong condition that. Uh, we can only make it work, work for a sufficiently small cone angles. Okay, but let me make a remark here. The fundamental shadow link complements form a um, actually a universal family in the sense that by doing this integral surgery along this fundamental shadow link complements, we can obtain actually all the closed oriented three manifolds. So that means the M in the theorem goes over all the closed hyperbol uh, all the closed oriented three manifolds. So that means if one can push this coangle theta here from very small to all the way to two pi then we solve the volume conjecture for closed manifolds for all of them. Okay. Because here we already have all of them. And the only problem is that the co-angles are, are too small. And I think if we work harder, we may probably push it from small to all the way to pi. But after the angle pi, we see some essential difficulty. Uh, but it doesn't say that, I'm not saying that uh, this approach is completely impossible because for certain cases, we can actually make it work. So for example, if the complement of the, of the link, in this case, a knot is homeomorphic to the figure eight knot complement, then we can make it work for all the cone angles. Um, are there any questions before I go to move to the next result? So uh, this theorem by Constantino and Thurston is mm -hmm. valid for all manifolds, not only hyperbolic manifolds, right? For all manifolds. Uh -huh. um, Actually, for and all volume, manifolds. Mm -hmm. a volume conjecture also have some degenerate form for non-hyperbolic manifolds. Yes. Um, and in that case, you consider the Grom, Grom of norm which is a constant times the sum of the volume of the hyperbolic pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, I noticed that in theorem one, you didn't mention hyperbolic. That means that this is also true uh, or proved uh, as part of theorem one oh, for non-hyperbolic um, manifold. I think here we consider the, the hyperbolic ones. But, uh, um, okay, you're right. So the ambient manifold itself uh, can be non-hyperbolic, mm -hmm. but we can still put hyperbolic cone matrix on this pair. Yeah, I see. But in this in this case, um, theta cannot be um, cannot um, we cannot push theta to two pi. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Um, maybe another question. So uh, if I know that uh, for a sufficiently small uh, theta. Mm -hmm. um, hyperbolic metric exists. Mm -hmm. Do we know that they also exist when we uh, change the value of theta? That's a very good question. So, so far people know that um, when you have a when you have a cone metric with all the cone angles less than or equal to pi, then we can decrease the cone angles all the way down to zero. I see. Yes. So we can connect everything with cone angles uh, less than pi to the, um, to the cusp 
metric on the complement. Mm -hmm. I see. But uh, in general, uh, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the main difficulty I mentioned here. Yeah, yeah, I see. Thanks. When the cone angles uh, become bigger than pi. So at least that's the difficulty from the hyperbolic side. And on the quantum side, we, we have other essential difficulties. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. All right, so um, the second work, um, we obtain a explicit formula of the twisted red master torsion for closed uh, oriented hyperbolic three manifolds. And this is to the best of my knowledge, the only e explicit formula uh, I know. Okay, so, and uh, here, since, um, every closed oriented three manifold is obtained from um, surgery uh, along a fundamental shadow link complement. I'll, uh, I'll start from here. So I'll consider the manifold as obtained by doing surgery along a fundamental shadow link. And then I'll use the link, the, the data from the construction of the fundamental shadow link. So let me tell you what those things are. Um, the building, the main building blocks are truncated tetrahedra. So you have a bunch of um, tetrahedra and then you chop off the corners, okay? And then you glue them together along these um, pairs of these small triangles. By doing this, you have a handle body like this. And then the union of the edges will form um, some curves on the surface of the handle body. Okay. So by gluing them together, you have a handle body and you have curves on the surface. Now we take the double of the handle body. That is, you take a mirror image of it and you glue the two together along the boundary via the identity map. By doing this, you have a closed manifold. And that's actually the connect sum of um, S2 cross S1. Okay, And then these curves coming from the union of the edges becomes a link inside the double. Okay? So you have a link in the double. And uh, the complement is a fundamental shadow link complement. And uh, as you can see, the building blocks are the tetrahedra. And here we want to use the, those tetrahedra. In particular, we want to use the so-called ground matrix of the tetrahedra. So for any six tuple of complex numbers, the ground matrix function is this, this, this matrix, okay? And it's called ground matrix because when these um, complex numbers are the dihedral angles of a hyperbolic tetrahedra, well, to be precise, are the dihedral angles cross i, the square root of negative one. Then this matrix is exactly the ground matrix of the tetrahedron. And the ground matrix is a, um, it's a central object in the study of, um, of tetrahedron. For example, given six real numbers, whether they form, whether they are the dihedral angles of a uh, hyperbolic tetrahedron, it is, um, completely determined by the signature of this ground matrix. Okay, so it's a very central object. Okay, now I think we are ready to state our result. Uh, can I have one more minute? Uh, yes, sure. So, um, suppose our manifold M is obtained by doing a hyperbolic surgery. So here we put some geometric condition from a fundamental shadow link complement. And uh, with um, this geometric condition, here we, we can obtain most closed oriented hyperbolic three manifold. Not all of them, pro um, not necessarily all of them, but most of them. So here we're talking about most uh, closed oriented hyperbolic three manifolds. Then the red master torsion twisted by the joint action of the holonomy representation has the following formula. 
where let me explain the terms, where f is a very concrete function. It's like hyperbolic sine, things like that. And ui are the uh, holonomy of the meridian of each component of L. Okay, So those are the quantities that determine this hyperbolic structure of L and one for each component of L. Okay. Since they determine the hyperbolic structure, they determine the torsion. So it makes sense to write this torsion in terms of these parameters. And the G is the ground matrix introduced in the previous slice. And here UK is the six tuple of the holonomy of the meridian of the components of L intersecting the case of tetrahedron. Okay, so that's our result. And as I mentioned, um, this is the, the only formula I know of this twisted red mass torsion. And it actually comes from the study of the, uh, of this asymptotic expansion conjectures I mentioned previously. So those are the terms um, that are supposed to show up here and here. And when we were doing the, the computation, we actually obtain the right-hand side, the gram, in particular, the ground matrices. So it is pretty surprising that uh, both of the two, the torsion and the ground matrices are well-known, well-studied. However, only until very recently, we, we see the relationship between the two. Okay, so um, this, um, I think this is one of the few works that the study of the quantum invariance can actually help um, to solve the um, purely geometric problems. And I think I'm going, uh, I, I think I should stop here, thanks. Thank you very much. So any questions? So um, could you maybe uh, repeat the definition for fundamental shadow link complement? Oh, sure. It's the union of um, truncated tetrahedra mm -hmm. along these small triangles. And then we take the double of the mm -hmm. handle body. So here, um, uh, where's the shadow link then? Oh, um, so those curves? Mm -hmm. Uh, come from the union of these edges of the tetrahedron. I see. So in this, the... this, um, this half comes from one tetrahedron and the other half comes from the other one. So if you take the union, you really, you really uh, get this. this mm -hmm. I see, I see. And I have to take L being uh, this union of edges. Yes. And the uh, uh, theorem by Constantine and Thurston is that if I perform uh, some surgery on L, I can essentially get all three manifolds. Exactly, yes. And actually, by doing surgery along some component of L, not all of them, we obtain all the three manifold with toroidal bond. I see. Mm -hmm. And if you do surgery along all of them, you have mm -hmm. all the closed three months. I see. Um, you mentioned at some point that the assumption on um, um, hyperbolic metric of this pair, uh, L, sorry, M comma L, is that, um, so one, one assumption is that um, all the components of the links are geodesics. Mm -hmm. um, so how is it related to, um, uh, fixed coin angle along the components. It seems that you are you using these two conditions interchangeably. So in the precise definition of the cone metric, we first um, take a triangulation of the uh, of the ambient manifold M, and we require that 
L is the union of some edges. And then you let each tetrahedron to be a hyperbolic tetrahedron. Yeah. Then this is like uh, in a hyperbolic tetrahedron um, along each, maybe this one is better, along each edge, the, the dihedral angle is fixed. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you take the sum of the dihedral angles around this edge. You have a fixed coin. Yeah, I see, I see. And also by construction, all the uh, components of the link is uh, geodesics of the hyperbolic By construction, measure. yes. Uh -huh. I see, thanks. Any other questions? So if not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks. I find it very clear and very interesting.